Thank you and greetings. It's always wonderful to be with you. That song sets the tone today, Joe. Thank you. That's really a burden on the heart of our Lord and Savior as he builds his church, as he sees the world as it is, and as he causes us to see that as we look at his word and we are guided by his spirit to understand the massive need that we're surrounded by. People need the Lord. And I'll tell you, they're going after things they don't need. Their life's getting cluttered up by things that are hindering their understanding of their need for God. And as is oft repeated here, we are so needy this morning for the Lord. So can we pray? Can we pray? <coughs> Father, we're asking you this morning to impact our hearts. And we thank you for your word and for your son and, and what he's doing this very hour to build the church. I thank you for this body of believers assembled today to bring you glory and worship. Father, our hearts and minds can become dulled and hardened in this time where sin is so rampant and things just seem to be coming at us at such a pace that we often lose sight of the fact that so many people around us do not belong to you. And God, every single man, woman, and child that we see has an eternal destiny and that so many are going the way of destruction and separation in the end. Father, we need to show a radical love, a sacrificial witness, and a bold proclamation of the fact that Jesus alone can save us of our sins. And we're needy of that grace and mercy every hour of our Christian life, and how much more the unbeliever who has the wrath of God abiding on him for his or her sins. Father, give us hearts of compassion. Let us learn today as we look at the scripture in John 5 that Jesus truly had compassion, but he also has the power, he has the authority, he has the equality with you to where he alone can give life. You alone can give life. It's the one true God, but the Trinity being involved in that. Lord, there's the destination. We need to come to you for life. And only you can save us of our sins. Father, we thank you for this day and we ask now, uh, just again, on behalf of family and friends that some of us are praying for at this very hour, some of us have crises and things that we uh, need to give to you this morning and just trust you with, but Lord, may we be prayerful and remember those things. Thank you, God, for being here with us. And we ask that you would be with us for the remainder of our day in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 5, open to John chapter 5 this morning. Hopefully, as we're getting started a little early, might mean that I'll get through the four pages of notes I have for this sermon. But again, thank you for your understanding. John chapter 5, as our brother read for our morning scripture, we have the stage already set for us. On the Sabbath day, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for an unnamed feast encountered a man there, and not randomly either. Jesus knew this man was there. And one might ask, for 38 years, he was probably unable to get about by himself to be anywhere else at that moment. But 38 years of paralysis is our point. 38-year condition, and Jesus sees him moved with compassion, says, do you want to be made well? And he had the excuses, didn't he? Well, I can't get into the water. The angel didn't, you know, when he stirs it, I can't get there. I can't people jump in in front of me? And Jesus just says, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. Absolute authority, total healing. So he's happily going his way, carrying the pallet under his arm that used to be his whole world, if you will. His limitations and everything that he uh, was used to as he probably looked and and looked down at that pallet at times of boredom and just went, man, I am confined, I am trapped, I am captive in this life. What hope is there for me? And Jesus says, I'm your hope. Get up and walk, get out. The Jewish leaders so thrilled that Jesus did that, by the way. So thrilled that they, in a predatory stance, and this is what we want to paint this morning as we jump right into where we left off. There's a predatory wickedness about these Jewish leaders. It is cloaked in a self-righteousness. It is cloaked in a holiness uh, of their own devising. And it is really that they are enslaved to a legalistic, religious, grind-you-in-the-gears type of lifestyle. 
all the while self-deceived into thinking, well, we are earning merit with God. We are on a level of the spiritual elite higher than anyone else. Better than the riffraff because of our performance and our abilities. And after all, who wouldn't want you on God's team? Amen. Man, God must be grateful for us most days. Am I right? I say that with a smile because God loves you this morning. God adores you. And He is happy that you're in the family. But we begin to get extremely deceived when we think that any of this is about us. When we think that we have some intrinsic goodness to bring to the table that actually adds to God's need for us. He doesn't have a need for us like we have a need for Him. Amen? Not even close. I've said this a million times, but the church marketing, the whole basis, according to George Barna, back in the 80s, I believe he said this, is that marketing is an exchange of equally valued goods. So therefore, we need to implement marketing into the church. And I went, that makes zero sense to me because what do I bring that's of equal value to Jesus and what he offers? What did you bring, Christ? Broken promises, your sins, the very nature of Adam flowing through you. Who you were in, in, in addition to the things that you did or don't do that is sin. That's what we bring. Amen? Someone once said it's often like asking your dad to borrow five bucks to buy him a present. <laughs> what real benefit is that to the father? But you know what? God loves us and he says he, all of heaven rejoices when somebody comes and gets saved. And that's what I want to begin here this morning. Get up and pick up your pallet and walk. Now, the, the, the leaders are saying, so where is this guy that cured you? Who, who, you, know, who are you attributing this to? And he goes, I don't know where he is. Let me, let me offer to you. Jesus was uh, unknown in terms of his location there that day because he didn't want to be known. He didn't want to be known. Look at verse, I think we're going to be in verse 15. John 5, 15. But, oh, no, excuse me, 13. But the man who was healed did not know who it was. Who, who, who healed me? For Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Intentionality. Jesus slipped away. Which is a good way of saying, hey, I'm fading into the background of the milieu that was happening there in Jerusalem that day. The, the coming and goings of the pilgrims there for the feast. And, and, and Jesus is now in a, in a place... Uh, Hidden, concealed, if you will. Why? By his own design. And we love this, and we'll see this emerge and develop in his ministry. But let's jump in here. Verses 14 through 15. You may not be able to find Jesus if you're this man that day, but he found the man. Look at verse 14 and 15. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore the nasb says so that nothing worse happens to you and the man went away and told the jews that it was jesus who had made him well notice uh, he's not giving the man the messianic secret uh, command if you want to call it that the Shh, don't tell him who did this jesus just comes up to him and finds him and then he says he gives him uh, what i believe to be a very stern warning i'm not saying that in the in the tone but look at what he tells him sin no more. In the Greek text here, it's, I believe it is maketi hamartan. Don't sin anymore. Cease your sinning. And this has led some to believe again that this has something to do with maybe, uh, perhaps the origin of the man's condition had something to do with sin. Now we can't say that because it doesn't tell us why. Jesus just knew that he was in a 38-year condition. But just for your own, if you're taking notes, I'm going to quickly give you a few references here. John 9, 3, the question of the disciples about the blind man who sinned was, who sinned, either this man or his parents? I mean, obviously, he's smitten by God, so what did he do to bring that on him? Or who, who's, whose fault is this? Let me, let me assure you, things happen in life, and God permits them to happen, and God can cause them to happen uh, for what? His glory. 
So you might be going through something right now that you're sitting here, please deliver me. Even like Paul with a thorn in the flesh, a, 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 a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. Please, I, I'm asking three times specifically, take this from me. No, because you need to demonstrate my strength and sufficiency in the midst of your trials. Can I be so bold this morning as to suggest that some of what you're going through may absolutely be and indefinitely, I believe, would be the design of God in your life. Oh, but I'm not prosperous and healthy and wealthy. That might be because you're following the God of the Bible and not the God of the word faith, goofball. I say that affectionately this morning. But see, understand something. The seasons, the trials that we're going through, it is working a much greater good in the life of the believer. There is no pointless tragedy for us this morning. I say that to comfort some of you, even this hour, who are having trouble in your families, who are having trouble in your, with your physical circumstances, and life happens, and we're stuck in it. God will walk with you through it. Amen? Take courage and take encouragement. Jesus told him in John 9, no, but didn't this man nor his parents sin, but this happened so what? The glory of God can be displayed. Think about your trials that way. Matthew 12, verse 43 to 45, there's that very strange yet interesting story about Jesus says if a demon goes out of a man, but he doesn't get his things taken care of, that the demon can bring seven of his friends, and the end of that man will be worse than the beginning. We'll get to that because that's a very fascinating passage with a lot in it about uh, demonic uh, influence in these things. But my point this morning is, does sin cause sickness? Does, is, there a, is there a possibility to be uh, uh, demonically influenced uh, to be sick? Yes, that's a possibility. John 8, 11, just using the same Greek phrase in the text, he tells the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Here's my point this morning. When he tells the man, sin no more, I really believe he means it. Amen? You have encountered the healing power of Almighty God. Jesus said to the man, behold, you have become well. Look at your state now. It's irrefutably a result of meeting the Messiah. So he says to him, with, in my mind, great and, and even more impounded, compounded authority in the ears of that man, go and sin no more. I'm going to listen. Amen? I'm carrying the pallet that I used to be enslaved. I, but I've been set free. i got a new lease on life. i got a new morning. i got new mercies. i got physical healing to demonstrate that God has visited me, I'm going to listen and I'm not going to go and sin. Folks, what would it take for you to listen to God's command to all of us to sin no more? Amen? What was Jesus saying? Go and live perfectly because you now have the ability to never sin again. That is not what he's saying. He's telling the man don't do it or something worse will come upon you. And I pick up with the question I left off very briefly last time. What on earth is worse than 38 years of paralysis? Some of you are going through something right now going, God, it cannot get any worse in my life. I promise you it can. Because, again, judgment from God is worse than anything you've gone through or are going through or will go through in this life physically. The conditions of this life will pale and disappear in the face of our Lord when we see him someday. And there will be no more tears and there will be no more pain and no more sorrow. But we have no such guarantee this side of eternity. And I promise you, the judgment of God is worse than 38 years of paralysis. Or fill in the blank with the complaints and beefs that we bring to God. Now I say this carefully. We're supposed to bring our concerns to God. We're supposed to cast our cares on him. So there is a place to lament and to ask for deliverance for every situation. Do you believe that this morning? I do. If you're sick. I want to pray that God heals you. How wonderful would that be? How wonderful for some of us, for all of us. I, I mean, I wish I could find the guarantee of healing in here that the faith teachers give you. But they're not reading the same Bible we're reading this morning or any morning. They've concocted this thing as they think God owes them. And here's what I want you to see. I really believe this man had a sense, as Jesus tells him this, of the immense, immeasurable mercy and grace of God. 
because he could be laying back at the pool at the house of grace. But now he's walking because of the power and the grace and the authority of God. Oh, I love this. I love Jesus as I read this because how grateful must this man have been? And then I'm reminded how grateful ought I to be that I have been spiritually healed from the trespasses and sins that I was enslaved and dead in. Are you grateful this morning for your salvation? Because microcosmically, this is a descriptive passage telling us about a physical healing here, but the analogy can be absolutely, should we be as grateful that we're not getting the judgment of God? And should we be as uh, inclined to say, help me not to sin? Don't want to be a recipient of the consequences of me turning away from God for one more minute. If that helps anybody here who's struggling with sin issues, then so be it. Let's, let's, let's pray together. God, help us. I love this. Verse 15. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And now verse 16 and 17, listen. Here's the confrontation of the Jews. And I'm immensely excited today to begin the argumentation of the equality of the deity and the divine authority that Jesus is going to claim here. I call them arguments, but they're really claims. They're really Jesus putting it out there that, hey, here's who you're dealing with, guys. Unabashedly and unashamedly, Jesus is going to sit here and tell us, I am deity. I am have a heavenly father and he's mine. I am working the way he's working. I do what he does in like manner. He loves me so much, Jesus is going to say, that he discloses to me only things that God knows. And I marvel that people walk away and go, well, Jesus never really explicitly claimed to be God. I remember in the 80s and 90s, I had to do an apologetics radio show and Kenneth Copeland's big claim that we were playing on our show. We played this clip where he just goes, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. I just claimed to walk with God. I just claimed to kind of have the power of God. I came, which is ridiculous because only God has the power of God. Amen. It's a claim. This is so clear as we read these passages, what Jesus is getting at here. And it was very clear to them. Let's take these verses one at a time. The equality argument or the equality claim, uh, there's three of them. They begin in verse 17 and they go to verse 30. And then in verse 31 through 47, the rest of what we call chapter 5, we have four witnesses that he brings to substantiate these claims. Jesus isn't just saying, hey, chew on this for a while, guys. I'm just self-asserting this here. Uh, consider this, if you will. No, I'm with God. I am God, and there are witnesses beyond any shadow of any doubt ever that have stepped forth in this life and testified at the top of their lungs like I'm doing right now that Jesus is God. He has the power of God. He has the authority of God. He is the second, uh, the second person of the Trinity, of the one true God. And at no time can we walk away not clear that he believed that about himself. So let us jump into this this morning and see how far we get. Verse 16. For this reason. What reason? The man telling the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. It says, for this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. And we have to stop here because it's going to, again, launch into the next verse, which is the first that we read in the ministry of Jesus where they give him a death threat. Okay, What could bring that out of the hearts and the mouths of these leaders? Well, it's precisely this phrase that Jesus just said, combined with what? His healing on the Sabbath. Now, they've already gotten on the man. You're working on the Sabbath. You're carrying your bed. And we talked about, we put that one to rest, if you will, that, listen, that's their legalistic interpretation of work on the Sabbath. Okay? 
And we could go to many passages about that. We won't. But really, the bone they have to pick then is the man responsible for this healing and the fact that he did it on the wrong day. And then, as if Jesus wanted to placate these guys, absolutely not, he says this phrase that we need to look at. What he's saying here, and this would be the first equality claim, equality with God in nature. The ontological, that's what a theologian would say about this argument, the argument from nature, that Jesus shares the nature of God. Jesus is divine like the Father is divine. And we could argue this throughout the scriptures, and we won't go to a lot of them, but we're going to... We're just going to look at this primarily. Look at what he says first. Let's look at his words in verse 17. This is the answer he gives. It says they were persecuting him. So he says to them, notice this, first two thunderous words in their pharisaical ears. My father. My father. I always bring this up. Forgive me for belaboring the point. But the acceptable way to talk about God in their language would have been Abraham. If you're talking about Abraham, our father, or God, our father, then you use the word Avinu, ours. We together call God our father. The Jews would not permit you to say my father ever about God. Do we understand that? So already Jesus has blown this whole a safety issue for himself out of the box. My father, how dare you? The son is a reflection of the father in that culture. He is of the same nature as the dad. So if your dad was a scoundrel, if you will, then guess what? That reflects immediately on the son. If the son is a scoundrel, well, he's reflecting the nature of the father. That's what they believe. So what if you were to come along and be so bold and to say, as Jesus did here, my father, I'm talking about God, and I'm using the my word. Well, did he do this before in his life? When did he do it? He was 12 years of age. And he had to be about the father's business in a personal way. It was his father. Jesus had no problem here violating what was not done, which was to say anything other than ours together. He's our Father. He's our God. Jesus goes, no, He's mine. Utterly unique, my friends, for Him to say that. So He's already started off the, phrase, the sentence here, my Father, and He says, is working until now, and I myself am working. Now we're getting into something else, too. Oh, he's saying he's dropping a bomb on him now, I'm telling you. First of all, God's my father. Second of all, he's working. And how many of us know that God's working? I sounded like some TV preacher. How many of y'all know God's working? That's not what I'm saying. God works. God works. And we can work the works of God. Understand, what, what happened? For six days of creation, God worked. And on the Sabbath... He rested. Why? Because he was tuckered out? No. He set that day aside in holiness and a cessation of the work. Interestingly enough, the rabbis, and even this is hinted, I'll tell you, this is hinted in the book of Hebrews when it talks about that we have yet a spiritual rest coming. We have a Sabbath coming. So what is it now in this life and in this time? It's work. We are to be working for the Lord, are we not? We are to be in the strength that he supplies, in the guidance that he gives, in the directives and the commands of Scripture, in the application of those things by the Holy Spirit. We are to obediently serve actively God. We are to minister to him. We are to minister to one another because we're responding to the command to minister and to serve God. You are to be working. Ask yourself, how's your work ethic right now in the body of Christ? How are you doing with that? Are you doing the good works? Is your life showing the fruits and the good works and abundantly that God wants us to have? Because we're sitting here going, here am I, use me. 
Whatever you've given me, I lay back at your feet and I ask for your strength and, and guidance to help me serve and burn out bright for you. And you know what I mean when I say burn out, not in, a, not in an exhausted way. I'm talking about just your life used up for the gospel, for Jesus. How are you working? Jesus is my father, is working or has been working. Listen. In the Greek, it's, Ergozete, he is working until now. And then he says, I have been working. Ergozomai, I am working. It's the opposite of being lazy or idle. So the Father's doing stuff, and Jesus says, I am also working with my Father. What are you claiming to do? You're claiming to be in participation with what God's doing. Which, once again, not only is he personally your father, but I'm working with him. Now, another interpretation of this passage has been, in light of what he was accused of doing, working on the Sabbath, that Jesus could have very well be implying that, listen, my father is working on the Sabbath, and I'm also working on the Sabbath, even at this very hour. You understand what I mean? More than just a generic, I'm doing stuff, it's, I'm doing it on the Sabbath. So, you got beef with me doing something on the Sabbath. Well, God's working on the Sabbath. And let me ask you this. Who has the right to work on the Sabbath? Anybody? Who? God does. And the Son of Man who calls himself Lord of the Sabbath. Do we not remember in Mark's Gospel, I believe? I'm trying to find my... Thing here and read my writing which is uh has morphed into some sort of a hebrew script long lost <laughs> absolutely long lost to us and untranslatable but i promise it started as english ah mark chapter 2 let us go to mark chapter 2 just for a moment this is the verse that rang in my ears as i read this passage and i read it over again and and i've been looking at this passage honestly for a couple of weeks and I can't escape the authority of Jesus in this passage. For him to tell them what he's telling them, not only is God my father, but I'm, I'm doing work. I'm doing work. And then just, again, the utter uh, uselessness and emptiness of the charge. What right do you have to do this on the Sabbath? Well, wait a minute. Mark chapter 2, verses 27 through 28 reads this way. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath, and, and we'll get to this episode later in his ministry. We, we haven't gotten there yet, but this involves with the disciples uh, plucking the heads of grain and eating them, remember? Oh, that's harvesting. That's field work. I just plucked some grain. and Yeah, well, you went like this in your hand before you ate it, right, to separate the husk and the chaff. Uh, that's grinding, so, right? Not allowed. We've, we've already put signs up about that. You're not supposed to do that. Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Verse 27, so the Son of Man, he says, is what? Curios, Lord of the Sabbath. You know, I kind of think that the Lord of the Sabbath has the right to do whatever he would deem to do on the Sabbath. And it could not be construed as a breakage of God's law. Why? Because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He knows the purpose and the reason and the motivations, and the fruit, and the resultant uh, things, and the actions, and the things that we're supposed to do. And guess what? He has every right to do what he wants, when he wants. Do you agree with that this morning? The authority of Jesus. Go back to John chapter 5. This first statement that he's making here then, upsets every apple cart that these guys are comfortable with. Wait, that's against our rules. Yeah, I, here's your rules, buddy. Who gave you the breath and the fingers to write the rules down? Who, who revealed what ought to be the way things ought to be? And who gave you guys the right to distort it? That's really what's coming right back at the Pharisees with their, with their uh, growing anger here. He says, my father's working until now, and I myself am working. I'm a participant in the work of the father. Now, because we're running out of time, 
if you're taking notes, which a few of you are, John 6, verse 28, 29 talks about the work of God. And they came up to Jesus and they went, they'll they come up later and go, well, how do we work the works of God? And he says, believe in the one whom he has sent. John 9, 1 through 5 talks about the work of God. And in that it says we are told to work because a time is coming, Jesus says, when no man will work. It's coming. Right now we ought to be faithfully working for the Lord. John 17, 4. Christ says, I finished the work that you gave me to do. Christ was on the clock and on the job at his mission here in the earth in complete and total submission to the Father. We'll get into that aspect here in a moment as well. But the context here is Sabbath work. Carrying your bed, that's the man's crime. But look here at verse 18. It says, for this reason... Therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. This is the first mention in the chronology of the ministry of Christ that they wanted to kill him. But to understand something, this is a plot that's been thickening for a long time. They're building their case to justify the killing of the Messiah. It says, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also, here it is, was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. John leaves no mystery here as to whether, well, I don't think he was being that clear to him. How obscure of a statement is what he meant. No, it was absolutely clear. He's making himself equal with God. How dare he? He's calling God his own father. And not only that, we could add this whole idea that he's co-laboring with God. He's working with God, even at the moment. They're sitting there going, this guy needs rocks thrown at him until he dies. Because that, my friends, is what Satan and the flesh desires against all who truly follow the living God. I don't want to make any mistake in what I'm about to say this morning. But an unbeliever is an enemy of Christ. They are an enemy of the gospel. They are antagonistic. They are sons of disobedience. They have God's wrath on them. They are damned, and if they do not turn and repent, they will suffer for eternity. No annihilationism. No, oh, well, after a million years, I guess we'll just kind of let them burn to a cinder and cease to exist. No, eternal conscious separation in flames and torment that were created initially for spiritual beings As Matthew 25 tells us, created for the devil and his angels, but if you want to be a goat, welcome to hell. Hell awaits. You will burn, and you will scream for eternity, and I believe it's very possible that it will replay in your conscious mind forever and ever and ever and ever that it did not have to necessarily be that way. You could have repented. You could have followed Jesus. You could have been a sheep and not a goat, but you will be sent literally to a devil's hell, if you want to use that phraseology, and you will burn in torment. You will not be with your friends. It will not be fun. It will not be one big party away from God. You will be wishing that you were never born. This is for anybody watching who hasn't heard for a while that there really is a thing called fire and brimstone and the Bible is full of it. Jesus speaks about hell more than he speaks about heaven content-wise. Why? Because it's that bad and he knows it's a real place. He knows the destiny of the wicked. He knows the sons of perdition and where they will land. He knows those things that are planned for the devil and his angels for eternity, for spiritual beings who have rebelled. They will suffer torment. And any human being who desires to go against God and come against Jesus, and that includes any of these men here who are sitting here going, ah, blasphemer. He's not equal with God. We deny that claim. We deny the authority that you're asserting. God is not your father. Later they will say, you're not doing this in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's Beelzebub. And Jesus, in a manner of saying, is saying, if you don't repent, you will meet 
the same end, which is really a continuous burning. The smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. The same phraseology for forever and ever used about the fire of hell will also is also used about the nature of God. So if God's not eternal, hell's not eternal, and inversely, hell's not eternal if God's not eternal. The Bible describes both in the same terms. You're like, Pastor, I didn't come here to hear this this morning. Didn't know I was going to say it. <laughs> but I'm telling you, this is what hangs in the balance for every man, woman, and child. And if you're here this morning and you're going, well, that's a scare tactic just to get me to believe in Jesus. If that worked, I would do it. Amen? I hope you're terrified if in some way, the word of God and what it says so explicitly. We didn't go to all the passages, but I'll promise you I'll walk you through them if you need to see them. We know. Many of us may have been many years since we've heard that kind of language being bandied about. But my prayer is that you understand something. God loves you immensely and desires that you come to him. I believe he really does desire all men to repent and turn to the truth. Now they won't. And many more will be lost than are found at the end. Jesus says, few there be who find eternal life. But he says in Matthew 7, many will say to me on that day, oh, we thought we were with you. Sorry. And you know what? The destiny is the same. Oh, I meant well. Hell is truth realized too late, isn't it? Isn't it? This is Brother Joe's fault this morning because he sang the song, People Need the Lord. <laughs> and I began to think, how much do we need the Lord? And I say, thank you, God, for rescue from the fires of hell. Oh, if that's the only reason you came to Jesus for fire insurance, no, but you know what? That's a wonderful benefit, <laughs> this relationship. I'm not, oh, well, that's all symbolic language. Symbolic of what? Flames and torment. There's not a good way to read that. And I do believe it's literal. So we can argue about that. But here's what I'm more concerned about this morning, that every single person in this room knows Jesus. That every single person in this room was worse off than the paralytic in this life before they knew Jesus and given eternal life because Jesus is who he claimed to be in this passage. Amen? I'm glad he's equal with God. I'm so glad that message got through to these guys. That blasphemer. I, I know what you're saying, Jesus. And then we have, to, we have no choice but to walk away from the text going, he was clear. Those guys knew it. Let's look at the context. They totally understood what he was saying, just like in John 8, 58, when he says, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones and throw. you can't say I am. Because that's a claim to be God. Jesus probably went, didn't you read three pages earlier, guys? I've been claiming that. I'm so glad I believed he's God. I'm so glad I've embraced his equality with the Father. I'm so glad that I worship the one true God in three persons, all of which are co-equal and co-eternal, and all of which, by the way, are mentioned with the same Greek terminology as the givers of life, giving life to those who believe. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Father gives life, the Son gives life, and the Holy Spirit gives life, and nobody else gives life. There's my second point to my really complicated point. Nobody else gives life. Nobody else can say, my father, like Jesus said, my father, in the unique way he was able to claim that. Jesus is the monogenes. He's the only begotten. He's the unique and special son of the living God. And he's sitting here saying, God's my father, and we got work to do. And it really doesn't have anything to do with your Pharisaic legalistic trap that you're in about what you consider work. Got it? God's good, man. His word's good. But it says he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So let us read then Jesus' claim of equality here before we have to close, which is soon. I'm going to skip a few points that I have written in this mystery script. But understand, Leviticus 24, 16 clearly says that anyone who blasphemes the name of Adonai, the name of the Lord, shall surely be put to death. 
So in their mind, the crime fits the punishment that they're about ready to deal on him or want to deal on him. We want him dead. Why? He's a blasphemer, and we have the law's backing. Leviticus tells us that we're supposed to kill anybody who blasphemes. Now, here's the thing. Our question today and the question of a skeptic listening or anybody who's going to tune in and give us hassles later about what we've said this morning, was Jesus a blasphemer? Settle it in your mind and heart. Read the word of God and come away with it and make your determination. Is he a blasphemer? Was he wrongfully claiming equality with God? Was he not authorized to say he's my father? Do you find welling up within you, how dare Jesus make that claim? And some have said he's either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. I mean, really, there, there it is. We don't patronize with the, with the term, well, Jesus was just a good teacher. No, he was a terrible teacher if he wasn't equal with God because he claimed to be equal with God. He was a liar. Or at best, he was delusional thinking with some Messiah complex that he actually was divine when he wasn't. He was a terrible teacher if he wasn't God. Do we agree on that? There's a challenge for our atheist friends. Oh, well, well, we're willing to give you. He was a good teacher. No, he was a terrible one because he really thought he was God, and he wasn't. He told us things like this, very clear, even to the Jewish people that are surrounding him right there. Listen, I'm I'm equal to the Father. Well, if you aren't, then you're the biggest liar in the world. We shouldn't listen to another word he says. So the decision must be made in our hearts. Do we accept the equality claim that he's making here? Equal with God in nature. Now, I'm going to read 19 through 21 as a chunk because this is the, it actually goes to 22, this argument. So we'll read 19 through 22, and we'll have to pick it up next week a little bit because there's some things in here we have to, we, we can't let them lie unless God, if God wants us to, we will. But listen to the, kind of the second claim would be equality with God in authority. I'm the same nature as the Father, but I also, what, have the authority of God. Jesus, you're making this rough on yourself, man. Kind of dial it back a little bit, will you? No. Watch what he says. And we love this. Verse 19. Just listen to this. I'm going to read this passage and we're going to pray. Because we've got to comment on this next week. But therefore, it says, Jesus answered and was saying to them. And I like the therefore because it's there for this reason. Because they said, you blasphemer, you're dead, man. Or, or we're about to do what we've got to do. Therefore... <laughs> So, let me tell you a little bit more. Let me elaborate on my authority. Well, I've already offended you. I've already got the, you know, got your hands itching to pick up them rocks, man. But let me, let me nail this one down a little bit better for you. And he'll do that, by the way, for another 20 verses. But we're going to read this chunk. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, amen, amen. That's what that says in the Greek. Amen. This is, you can, you can. Put the stamp on this one. He says, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner, in the same way. Who can see what the father's doing? God. Who can do what the father's doing? God. Who can do it in the same way that God does it? God, where's he going with this? Verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. The two greater works now mentioned, verse 21, greater work number one, for just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son also gives life to whom he wishes. Greater work number two, verse 22, for not even the father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the son so that all will honor the son even as they honor the father. And he who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. We're going to stop right there because he's going to continue speaking about resurrection and power and authority. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that Jesus does not shrink from the intimidation or the persecution, let's say the attempted intimidation to him, because I don't think he's scared here. How about you? You know, I've been known to say things that as I'm saying them, 
my conscience or whatever else is going, no. <laughs> you write that email and you hit send. Wait, too late. Can't get it back. Comes out of your mouth and you're saying, what am I saying right now? You know, I believe that Jesus never had that moment. How about you? Is he down here struggling with his identity in this passage? Is he going, oh, man, Martin Scorsese will be right when he, when he makes the movie The Temptation of Christ. I just don't know if I'm the Messiah. Even some grace brethren writers have hinted at Jesus was unaware of his Messiahship and Godhood until the baptism. We won't get into that. But I really don't think there was ever a moment in Jesus' life where he panicked about this or whether he was so burdened. Am I really, you know, what's going on here? And I will tell you, of course, by the time of his ministry here, there's no way that there's a doubt in his mind here that he is who he claims to be. So my final impartation to you this morning, impartation, whatever, exhortation, whatever, you know, whatever you want to put on it. The final thing that's going to fly out of my mouth, prayerfully, it's going to be true. Jesus is the beloved son of God in whom the father is well pleased and we ought to hear him. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your authority. Thank you for the authority and the power of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the co-equality that exists in the Godhead. I thank you for the, the co-eternal nature. I thank you for these wonderful correspondences between the persons of the Trinity that Jesus knew his father and his father knew him and the father loved the son and so he gives the son access and disclosure to what he's doing and so that Jesus can rightly and with absolute integrity and purity with no sin involved execute the will of the father in every phase of his life, thereby living a sinless life as our example. You're our Father because we believed in your Son and you've saved us from our sins. Father, I want to end today with just asking that your Holy Spirit would convict hearts that need convicting. If there's anyone in this room, right here in this geographical location on these premises, that is struggling with believing or receiving or accepting the claims of Jesus to be their only hope, the only way, the only truth, the only life, the only one who can give eternal life. I pray in the name of Jesus this morning that they will cry out to you for forgiveness of their sins, that they will agree with you, that they have offended you, not just by what they've done, although those are all there too, but by who they are because they need salvation. The sin has been given to us because we are children of Adam and we have inherited a nature that has fallen and must be redeemed and transformed or we will never be saved from a fiery destiny. Father, if there's anyone in here this morning that needs to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for sin on the cross that died in their place and took upon Him the penalty of their sins so that they could ask forgiveness when they realized that and they could say, I accept and believe in what Jesus did for me on the cross. And that we accept and believe by faith that He was laid in a tomb and three days later resurrected to prove that He is the resurrection and the life and the one who gives life to all who would believe on Him. Father, I pray this morning that it would be a day of victory and rejoicing in heaven if there's anyone in here who needs to get right with You and cry out for salvation. Father, I don't mean out loud. I don't mean that we have to do some ritual to try to enact that, but God, work in people's hearts. And Father, let everybody know in this room right now or watching online or whenever that's going to be this week, that they can talk to us, that they can call us, that they can ask questions about this glorious and beautiful faith that you revealed to us and, 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 and how to be saved and, and, and how we can pray for them or help them pray or pray with them. Father God, we just ask that you would move in hearts that need salvation because people need the Lord more than life itself, more than the things that they seek after and put their faith in that cannot save them. Father, we need eternal life. 
We need to be in your presence for eternity, safe and enjoying an eternal existence in the direct presence of your glory and power. And it's all because of Jesus. Thank you so much. Again, thank you, God, for all you've done in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.